Learning with Ron Pon. Hello and welcome to episode two of Learning with Ron Pon. This is the podcast where we just talk about random facts. I uh, I was a big fan of Uncle John's bathroom reader when I was a kid. Uh, I spent a good deal of time in the bathroom, and I spent a good deal of that time reading the bathroom readers. And I remember all the little facts at the bottom, you know, the one-liner at the bottom of every page. I remember thinking, I wish there was just a YouTube video I could watch that was just that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do m- mostly that. Um, at least for the first bit. I just have 20 interesting facts, and, and this week is, is more interesting than last week, in my opinion. And then as we go, if there is something that really strikes my fancy, I will just do that and uh, learn a bit more about it. And hey, if you want to enjoy this live and you want to suggest some topics, check out uh, YouTube Live or Twitch. I, uh, I, I'm not doing kick at the moment. I, I swapped kick out for YouTube on the Restream app because you can only have two for free. And I don't feel like paying for a third. But I might do it soon. We'll see. Anyway, let's hop right on in, uh, and I hope you enjoy the AI-generated images, uh, which I used Leonardo.ai for. It's quite, it's quite nifty, and they just came out with a new update that I will be playing around with, I think, for this episode. So if you like them, check it out. You can do a bit for free, and then you can pay if you want more. So let's begin 20 interesting facts. Unless I cut one out, or two, in which case it'll be 19 or 18. Just a lot of interesting facts. Also, if you want to help support me, so that I can just keep chilling here and reading out fun facts for you, you can either hit me up on Patreon, patreon.com slash ronpawn, or you can uh, buy my book. I, I made a nursery rhyme book. It's a picture book. It's $10 US, $9.99 on Amazon called Ron Pond Nursery Rhymes. Uh, I don't know, that's kind of fun. I also made those illustrations with the Leonardo thing, which is surprisingly time-consuming. Uh, it takes a lot of fiddling. You can get a good image with little work, but if you have something particular in mind, it takes a lot of fiddling. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get into some facts, shall we? Architecture. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was never actually straight. It started to lean during its construction due to the soft ground it was built on. I actually knew this one before, and it still doesn't really make sense to me. I feel like once it starts leaning, you should be like, all right, hang on, (laughs) straighten it before we... whatever. Animals. Hippos secrete a red, oily substance called blood sweat, which helps protect their skin from sunburn and keeps it moist. It's not actually sweat or blood. All right. Expand on blood sweat. What the heck? Despite its somewhat gruesome name, blood sweat is not actually blood or sweat. The term is used to describe a reddish oily substance that they secrete from their skin. This unique secretion comes from two types of glands in a hippo's skin, mucous glands and pigment glands. The pigment glands produce two types of highly acidic substances, one that's red, called hippo's sudoric acid, and one that's orange, called norhipposidoric acid. <laughs> you gotta know what the hippo stands for. These substances mix with the clear secretion from the mucous glands and end up looking like a shiny red sweat, hence the name blood sweat. But here's the cool part. This blood sweat has several key functions that help hippos survive in their environment. For one, it acts as a natural sunscreen. The red pigment absorbs light in the ultraviolet and visible range, providing protection from the sun's harmful rays. For a creature that spends a lot of time in the bright hot sun, this is a pretty useful adaptation. Additionally, it appears that the secretion has antibacterial properties. The acidic nature of the blood sweat inhibits the growth of certain bacteria, keeping the hippo's skin healthy even in muddy or dirty water. Some studies even suggest that it might act as an insect repellent. I need some of that. One thing it doesn't do, contrary to what you might think, is help the hippo cool down. Unlike humans, hippos don't have sweat glands that produce true sweat to regulate their body temperature. Instead, they rely on water or mud to stay cool, which makes sense. All right, well, that's interesting. Let's move on. Astronomy. There is a planet where it rains glass sideways. 
It's called HD 189733b, and the blue hue of its atmosphere is believed to be caused by silicate particles which scatter blue light. Do we know that? Expand on three. That seems like something we might be extrapolating from. I want to know how certain we are of that. That could be a good uh, clickbait. A little short. HD 189733b is a gas giant exoplanet located about 63 light years away in the constellation of Vulpecula. It's known as a hot Jupiter because it's a similar size to Jupiter, but orbits very close to its star, making it incredibly hot. But the weather on this planet is what makes it truly out of this world. And the fact that it's out of this world. Scientists believe it rains glass there sideways. Here's why. The atmosphere of HD 189733b, I'm just going to call it HD if it comes up again. It doesn't, so it do no, it does. Good. Is thought to contain a high concentration of silicate particles. On Earth, silicates are a key component of sand and glass. When temperatures reach up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,093 degrees Celsius, in the planet's atmosphere, these silicate particles could potentially vaporize, condensing in the planet's high winds into tiny shards of glass. The winds on HD are extreme, blowing at speeds of more than 5,400 miles per hour, about seven times the speed of sound. That's what causes a glass rain to whip sideways through the atmosphere. This data comes from observations made by the Hubble Space Telescope and other observatories. Scientists can analyze the chemical makeup of an exoplanet's atmosphere by studying the starlight that passes through it. However, it's important to note that while the observations suggest this wild weather, it hasn't been directly observed. The details of weather on exoplanets are still an active area of research. Alright, so that that kind of confirms what I figured. They're, they're being a little fast and loose with the raining glass, and it's mostly you know, an extrapolation from what we can see rather than uh, an actual observation. Because it's 63 light years away. It takes 63 years traveling at the speed of light to get there. Which we can't really do. Number four. Biology. Humans share about 50% of their DNA with bananas. That's right, we're all half banana. Kind of. Well, I've heard that before, actually. I've heard we're way more like mushrooms, actually. Hang on. Compare our DNA similarity with bananas to our similarity to mushrooms. I'm curious. It's true that we share about 50% of our DNA with bananas. This is because all life on Earth shares a common ancestor, and therefore some amount of DNA. This 50% doesn't mean we're half banana, but rather that half our genes have a common function with genes in the banana. So, yeah. yeah. Fooling us. Alright, apparently it's around 50% as well for mushrooms. Fun fact, despite the similarity in terms of DNA sequence, we're actually more closely related to mushrooms than to plants. This is because humans and mushrooms belong to the same group of organisms called opisthokonts, O-P-I-S-T-H-O-K-O-N-T-S, whereas plants belong to a different group. This doesn't mean we're more mushroom than human, but it does underscore the surprising and complex nature of evolutionary relationships. Yes, it does. Technology. The QWERTY keyboard layout, which is the one that starts at a Q, you know, left to right, the one that you're used to, was designed to prevent typewriters from jamming, not for typing speed. Early typists were so quick the mechanical keys would get stuck together. Now, yeah, there's actually a, another keyboard that apparently lets you type faster, but I learned on QWERTY and I... I'm a fast typist, so I just stick with QWERTY. I can't, I'm too old to learn new things now. What? You crazy? History. Romans used crushed mouse brains for toothpaste. Not quite the mini freshness we're used to today. All right, expand on six. I gotta know more about that. Sounds nasty. The ancient Romans were meticulous about their dental health, but they didn't have access to the kinds of products we do today. One of these was a toothpaste made from crushed mouse brains. Mouse brains were one of the ingredients that Romans thought could help keep their teeth clean. They believed that mouse brains had properties that could prevent tooth decay and freshen the breath. They'd catch and kill mice and crush their brains into a paste. This paste was then used much like we'd use toothpaste today. It's likely that the Romans used some sort of stick or cloth to apply the paste, as the toothbrush as we know it didn't come into use until much later. Other recipes called for the ashes of ox hooves, eggshells, charcoal, and even the ashes of burned mouse heads. 
It's important to note, though, that just because the Romans used these ingredients doesn't mean they were effective. Many of the ingredients they used probably did more harm than good. For example, some Roman toothpaste recipes included abrasive substances that could wear down tooth enamel over time. Did the mouse brains work? There's no scientific evidence to suggest that this practice was actually effective for dental health. In modern dentistry, toothpaste generally contains fluoride, abrasives, and detergents. Fluoride helps to strengthen tooth enamel and prevent decay, abrasives assist in removing plaque, and detergents help spread the toothpaste around the mouth and create the foaming action we're familiar with. Most brains would not contain these components. Moreover, using animal tissues for oral care could potentially introduce bacteria and other pathogens to the mouth, which would be counterproductive to maintaining oral hygiene. Yeah. So, probably didn't work. That sucks. Mushing mouse brains around your mouth and it doesn't even help. You know, it's funny, because it, there is something that seems healthy about doing things that don't taste or feel good. I don't know. One time I, I was at cub camp and I stared into a fire for like two hours straight trying to give myself laser eye <laughs> surgery. <laughs> so many things wrong with that idea. Environment. If you collected all the gold ever mined in the world, it could fill around three Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's bonkers to me. That seems so little, doesn't it? I know Olympic swimming pools are big, but... Like, we've been mining gold for so long. It's crazy. Food. Carrots were not always orange. They used to be predominantly purple and white until Dutch growers in the 17th century cultivated orange carrots as a tribute to William of Orange. That's really cool. Like, I've seen heirloom carrots, I'm sure we all have. But it's interesting that the orange was specifically bred. Geography. Reno, Nevada is further west than Los Angeles, California. No, really, check a map. I, I believe you. And that's crazy. And also, secondary fun fact... Uh, courtesy of Veep, apparently it is Nevada and not Nevada, as you often hear. Um, while we're on the subject, people in Louisville, Kentucky call it Louisville and not Louisville, for the most part. I did a, an audiobook where that was a, a thing I had to change. Chemistry. Helium is the only substance in the universe that cannot be in a solid state under normal pressure. It's always up for a party. <laughs> I like when it throws in little jabs. I actually had to make it rewrite this a few times because it kept adding way too corny little afterthoughts. Literature. The shortest sentence in English literature is go. It's a complete sentence that appears in For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Interesting. Animal Kingdom. Penguins propose to their mates by offering them a pebble. They've got the whole romance thing down. That I actually knew. And it is adorable. Economy. The word billionaire wasn't used until 1844 because, well, the world didn't have any. Who was the first billionaire? Interesting. Okay, so I'll just condense what it's just told me. Uh, so while the term did come into use in 1844, there wasn't actually a billionaire by then. I guess they were just kind of speculating because there were millionaires. And so they just kind of said, well, if somebody got a billion they'd be a billionaire. But there wasn't one until John D. Rockefeller, who became one in the early 20th century. Uh, his wealth reached a peak of about 1.2 billion in 1913, which is the equivalent of about 30 billion in today's dollars. Nifty. By the way, if you've only heard Rockefeller, you might have wondered if it's Rockefeller or Rockefeller, and it's Rocka, R-O-C-K-E-F-E-L-L-E-R. Okay. Philosophy. Socrates, or Socrates, was given a chance to suggest his own punishment. He proposed a wage paid by the government and free dinners for the rest of his life. Uh, what was Socrates punished for? He was sentenced to death in 399 BC for charges related to impiety and corruption of the youth. Yo, Socrates was the original groomer. 
Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, was sentenced to death in 399 BC for charges related to impiety and corruption of the youth. Let's break down what that means. Impiety. The Athenians were deeply religious people, and the city-state of Athens had its own official gods that were to be honored by its citizens. Socrates was accused of not recognizing these gods and instead introducing new ones. This was viewed as a form of blasphemy, a serious offense in ancient Athens. Starting to see that nowadays. Corruption of the youth. Socrates was also accused of corrupting the minds of the young people of Athens. He was known for questioning everything and encouraging others, especially young men, to do the same. This critical approach often led to the questioning of traditional beliefs and societal norms which alarmed the authorities. They saw Socrates' influence as destabilizing and potentially harmful to the city-state's future. During his trial, Socrates was given the opportunity to propose his own punishment. He suggested a reward rather than a penalty, arguing that he had done Athens a service by prompting people to question their assumptions and strive for wisdom. His suggestion was not well received, and he was sentenced to death by drinking a potion containing poison hemlock. Hmm. So maybe not so much being a groomer. I guess maybe he's more comparable to... Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't want to say like Jordan Peterson, because that's way too kind to Jordan Peterson, but... It does seem a little more like that situation. Though Peterson is <laughs> legit corrupting. <laughs> but he shouldn't be put to death. Uh, I actually never realized that Socrates was put to death. What? How have I never heard this? That's crazy. Sports. Basketball nets. Hey, it's basketball again. Basketball nets are just large enough to fit two basketballs through at once. That I actually did know also. From... You know, doing basketball. I think I saw somebody's show. Or it's from... No, it's from... I watched this... I read this book. Oy, how times have changed. I immediately went to say watched. I read this book called The Million Dollar Shot in grade two. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's where it, it was mentioned. It was a good book. It was exciting. You should read it. If you're a, if you're a young person, you should read A Million Dollar Shot. I don't get any royalties or anything. I do get royalties from Ron Pond's nursery rhymes, so if you want to read some funny nursery rhymes, check it out on Amazon. Ron Pond's nursery rhymes for sarcastic assholes. Health. The average human produces enough saliva in their lifetime to fill two swimming pools. The Eiffel Tower can grow more than six inches during the summer due to the expansion of iron on hot days. That is so cool. Mathematics. Zero is the only number that can't be represented in Roman numerals. Ah, oh, well, we're going to learn more about that. Because I want to know if... Because that, that could actually be really indicative of, of just their way of thinking. If they didn't even have a, a conception of zero. But it could also just, you know, be an oversight. The concept of zero as we understand it today was not present in the system of Roman numerals, which is why you don't see a symbol for it. There it is. The Roman numeral system includes the symbols I for 1, V for 5, X for 10, L for 50, C for 100, D for 500, and M for 1000. There's no symbol for zero in this system. The absence of something was often either implied by context or just not recorded. The concept of zero as a number with its own value and as a placeholder in positional number systems was developed in ancient India, likely around the 5th century AD. The idea of zero then gradually spread to other cultures and regions through trade and scholarship. In the Roman system, if you wanted to represent the number 2007, for example, you would write it as MMVII, which breaks down as 2000 MM plus 5V plus 2II. There's no need for a zero to indicate the absence of tens or hundreds. This lack of a zero is one reason why calculations with Roman numerals can be cumbersome compared to calculations with the Hindu-Arabic numeral system that we use today, which does include zero. The Roman system is also non-positional, meaning the value of a symbol depends on its context rather than its position, which is another reason why it's less suited for complex calculations. Neat. Physics. Oh, this one's cool. If you scream for eight years, seven months, and six days, you would have produced enough sound energy to heat one cup of coffee. Huh. How cool is that? Obviously, this isn't exact because different people scream at different volumes and different pitches and with different amounts of energy, whatever. But, you know, it's around that. And it's really cool. 
and music. In 2016, Mozart sold more CDs than any other artist, proving that nearly 225 years after his death, he still got it. He, he, he does, he does still got it. Well, that was very neat. Now, unfortunately, there's no one here to suggest anything, so I'll just have to think of something my dang self. Hmm. Please give ten little-known secrets about movie industry. These can be about behind the scenes stuff, technical stuff, or whatever. Why not? Number one, multiples of everything. For important props or costumes, especially in action films, there are often multiples of everything. This is to ensure that shooting can continue even if something gets lost, damaged, or destroyed during a stunt. Two, realistic space silence. In space, no one can hear you scream, or anything else for that matter. Sound doesn't travel in the vacuum of space. Films like 2001 A Space Odyssey and Interstellar have been praised for their scientifically accurate use of silence in space scenes. 3. Color Correction Magic Movies often look different on set. Through color grading or correction in post-production, filmmakers can dramatically change the mood and aesthetic of a film. It's like Instagram filters, but on steroids. This is something that I really only started appreciating once I started editing things. Um, like my, my videos, especially the Sim stories. If you haven't checked those out, check it out on YouTube. They're kind of fun. Um, and it's really neat. It's really crazy how much control you have, especially just over color and how much of a difference it makes. It really makes me want to make more movies. The more I learn about these tools, the more I want to just make more. Foley artists. Ever wonder how movie sound effects are made? Foley artists create these sounds in a studio, often using everyday items. For example, they might snap celery to mimic the sound of breaking bones, or rustle gloves for bird wing flaps. I didn't know about that, I didn't remember they were called that. But I've, I, I watched a documentary about a couple, and uh, it was really neat. It looked kind of fun. Animals' well-being. In movies with animals, the American Humane Association often steps in to monitor their treatment. Hence the disclaimer, no animals were harmed at the end of films. They ensure animals are safe and treated well during production. That is not a very interesting fact. Oh well. Hidden CGI. Visual effects aren't just for explosions and fantasy creatures. There's often a lot of invisible CGI used in films to alter backgrounds, remove unwanted elements, like wires and action scenes, or even to change the time of day. These are not that interesting. I, I, I apologize. But we'll finish them out. Number seven, post-credits scenes. Stick around after the movie ends. Some... <laughs> Okay, I'm not even... No, I'm not even including that. Scratch 7. That's not interesting. Script supervisors. These unsung heroes ensure continuity in films. They make sure that from one shot to another, things remain consistent, like the level of drink in a character's glass, or a Starbucks cup on a table in a fantasy show. Despite their best efforts, some mistakes do slip through. Do you think? Improvisation. Some of the most iconic movie lines were never in the script. The actors improvised them on the spot. For instance, the line, He is looking at you, kid, in Casablanca, was an ad lib by Humphrey Bogart. That's really cool. I didn't know that one. That's going to be our next little segment. That'll be interesting. Number 10, set recycling. Movie studios often reuse sets from other films. For example, the set of the Mos Eisley Cantina in Star Wars was redressed and used as the Temple of Doom in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's awesome. Okay. First, please give me 10 examples of improvised lines from older movies before the 1970s. This is so cool. All right, so it repeats Casablanca. Uh, Casablanca, 1942, Humphrey Bogart came up with the line, he was looking at you, kid, while playing poker with Ingrid Bergman between scenes. That's cool. I like the expansion on that. Some Like It Hot, 1959. Joe E. Brown improvised the classic closing line, well, nobody's perfect. A Streetcar Named Desire, ooh, a little, 1951. 
Marlon Brando's agonizing cry, Hey, Stella! was not in the original script. That is classic. The Maltese Falcon. Falcon, 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 1941. Humphrey Bogart ad-libbed, The stuff that dreams are made of, which ended up being one of the most iconic lines of the film. Actually, <laughs> side note, I'm not actually, I don't really remember what Humphrey Bogart sounded like. I feel like it was kind of like that. But I might just, <laughs> I might just be doing a generic kind of accent I associate with the time period. Uh, I apologize if I'm way off. Dr. Strangelove, 1964. Peter Sellers improvised much of his dialogue in the film, including the line, Mein Führer, I can walk! Six, It Happened One Night, 1934. Clark Gable's line, I like peace and quiet, and I don't have to take that from you or any other woman, was improvised. Okay. On the Waterfront, 1954, the classic line, You don't understand, I could have had class, I could have been a contender, I could have been somebody, was partially improvised by Marlon Brando. Rebel Without a Cause, 1955. James Dean's memorable line, I got the bullets, was ad-libbed. It's not memorable to me. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, 1948. Madre, I guess. Whatever. Humphrey Bogart's line, Come out from behind that badge, you know what's gonna happen, was not in the original script. Hmm, I like that. Although, when they say it was not in the original script... I get a little suspicious that it wasn't actually him coming up with it, but whatever. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, 1966. Eli Wallach's line, When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk, was improvised. Ten facts about Mark Twain's life. Mark Twain, born Samuel Clemens, is one of the most celebrated authors in American literature. Known for his wit and social critique, Twain led an intriguing and complex life. Here are ten unusual facts about him. Pseudonym Source Twain worked as a steamboat pilot before he was a writer. His pen name, Mark Twain, is a term derived from his days on the river and means the water is two fathoms deep, a safe depth for boats. Hm. Predicted his death, Twain was born shortly after a visit by Halley's Comet. Is it Halley's or Halley's? I think it's Halley's in 1835, and he predicted he would go out with it. He died the day after the comet returned in 1910. That's kind of neat. Highly superstitious, I guess so. Twain was very superstitious. He was particularly wary of the number 13, and always refused to have 13 guests at a meal, or to seat 13 people at a table. He'd get along well with dwarves, although... Was it 13 for them? Hmm. Bankrupted by invention. Twain invested a large portion of his wealth in a typesetting machine called the Page Compositor. The machine was a commercial failure, leading Twain to bankruptcy. Temperance Speaker at age nine. As a child, Twain was often asked to deliver speeches. At the age of nine, he was even asked to give a temperance lecture. Is that like a religious thing? The term temperance lecture refers to a speech advocating for temperance, which in this context is the moderation or even total abstinence from alcohol. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the temperance movement was a significant social movement in many countries, including the United States. The temperance movement was primarily driven by religious groups who believed that alcohol was the root cause of many societal issues, including domestic violence and poverty. I mean, it, it doesn't help. The movement gained significant traction and eventually led to the enactment of prohibition in the United States, a period from 1920 to 1933, during which the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages were banned. <laughs> this all is especially ironic given that Twain was known to enjoy a drink or two as an adult. All right, banned in Concord. Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was called Trash and banned by the Concord Public Library upon its release in 1885. Twain was delighted by the news. <laughs> I like that. Impersonator. Twain was known to occasionally impersonate his own impersonators. <laughs> he would attend their performances and then stand up to show the audience who the real Mark Twain was. Please stand up. Please stand up. Okay. Inventor. Twain held a few patents. He invented a self-pasting scrapbook, an elastic strap for vests, a predecessor to the adjustable strap, and a history trivia game. Skeptical of religion. 
Yeah. Although Twain was raised in a religious household, he became skeptical of organized religion and was known for his irreverent humor towards it. Was he ever? Had a twin brother. I didn't know that. Twain's brother Henry was a steamboat pilot who died in an explosion. Twain had a premonitory dream about the incident, which deepened his interest in parapsychology. That's where he loses me. But that's real interesting. I, I, Mark Twain is an interesting fellow. Ooh, how long have this been going? This is probably long enough, yeah. 46 minutes, that'll be cut down to like 30. All right, let's do, let's do some, let's close out with some famous quotations. Please give 10 quotations about the laughter. Why not? Laughter is an instant vacation. Milton Berle. I don't trust anyone who doesn't laugh. Maya Angelou. Laughter is the shortest distance between two people. Victor Borgia. Is that the penis guy? I love him. If that's, if that's who it is, I think it is. Yeah. Oh, I love him. Okay. If you're, if you're listening to this, we're almost done. Once this video's done, look up Victor Borgia, uh, V-I-C-T-O-R-B-O-R-G-E on YouTube. He's like a, a pianist who does comedy piano. Very good. I really like it. Laughter is the sun that drives winter from the human face. Victor Hugo. That's lame. A good laugh heals a lot of hurts. Madeline Langle. The earth laughs in flowers. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson. Can't tell if I love or hate that one. Laughter is poison to fear. George R. R. Martin. I like that one. Always laugh when you can. It is cheap medicine. Lord Byron. Laughter is carbonated holiness. Anne Lamott. And finally, and incredibly fittingly, the human race has only one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. None other than Mark Twain. That was really fitting. And laughter is good. I am not naturally much of a laugher, if I'm being honest. My, my natural state is kind of one of apparent glumness. Though I'm not glum. I just kind of have a resting glum face. <laughs> Which I, uh, I learned to mask in like grade 7 or 8 after the 300th person said, Ron, you gotta smile more. But uh, laughter is good. And smiling is good. Sometimes. But if you feel the need to constantly be doing it so that people don't say stuff to you is it's not ideal anyway this has been the second episode of learning with ron pond i hope you enjoyed if you did please like and subscribe that helps a lot um leave a comment down below if you're watching this on youtube if you make a comment on this episode maybe i can talk about a topic you suggest in the next episode also make sure to check me out on youtube and twitch for live streams Twitch is uh, the underscore Ron Pond. YouTube is at Ron Pond or Ron Pond Videos. And of course, if you want to support me, you can go to patreon.com slash Ron Pond or buy my book, Ron Pond's Nursery Rhymes, on Amazon. Anyway, special shout out to my one patron, Nelio, who, uh, you know, he's one of my best friends, so it's a little cheating, but still super appreciated. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay learning. <laughs>